Here we are again in our live stream, HVEC School live stream, and we've got some really great guests, guys who uh, have been great contributors to HVEC School over the years in the symposium. Uh, David Richardson is with NCI, um, longtime trainer over there, and Ed Johnawak, uh, master sultan uh, wizard over at ACA. So, and then our, our usual moderators um, and contributors to HVAC School, Adam Mufich and Matt Bruner. So today's topic is going to be about making duct systems work. Specifically, we're going to be talking a lot about how to go into an existing uh, situation and how to improve um, the equipment, how to improve the duct system, but really even more than duct systems, how to improve airflow specifically. We're going to be talking a lot about airflow and how to make it better. Um, and to start with, some of these slides are, are straight from uh, a slide deck that a uh, presentation that uh, David uh, did at the HVCR training symposium. Um, so I'll kind of give it over to you, uh, David. The question is, um, where do we look for perfection versus progress and what's the difference? Now, the, it's one of the biggest obstacles that keeps guys from starting because they think in order to do anything with a duct system, they have to start from scratch, make it absolutely perfect, or you can't do anything at all. And, you know, many times a customer, they don't want that. They just want to, or maybe your room improved, or you're trying to improve the external static pressure of the system and get the airflow where it needs to be so you can actually make the equipment do what it's supposed to do. And so a lot of times people think they have to redesign everything from scratch instead of just making simple repairs at the equipment that really make a big difference. It's amazing what you can do just right at the equipment on the supply side and the return side with a properly selected filter and a good coil. I mean, it, it makes a big difference on the little things, just being able to get the air out of the equipment. So I think as we look at this perfection thing, many times won't, people won't even start. And it's one of the biggest enemies of it. Instead of, you know, being imperfect and trying something and saying, you know, hey, what will happen if I do this and then measure, verify it, and then making another adjustment, they just let fear keep them from doing anything. And I think if, if you can overcome that first step when it comes to doing this, you know, even on your next replacement job, just look at one simple thing that you can do to improve airflow. You're going to be ahead of the curve for most of the companies because they're not even looking at it or thinking about it. I'm going to turn that over to you, Ed. So <clears throat> obviously you're with ACA. And so a lot of people, when they hear ACA, they imagine, well, I'm supposed to do a manual D every time I change anything, right? Like I've got to redesign the entire duct, assist, duct system every time I do anything. What are your thoughts on that? Well, you don't actually have to do a full manual D or a, a duct design on a new system. But one thing that would uh, warp the cockles of my heart would simply be follow the rules that are in manual D. If we have a uh, existing system and there's things that are missing that are in the guidance of manual D, if you add some of them, you can take a, a less than ideal system and make it pretty stellar. One of the things that I heard David uh, say earlier, he, he used the word filter. And if I was on camera, then I would have went like that because whenever I hear filter immediately, I think of, well, number one, I can sell somebody something that they want and they don't even realize it. And we can do tremendous things to help the system. And I really don't like using the word breathe, but it's what popped into my head. You can make the system flow more air more readily. See, I didn't use breathe uh, by putting in a proper filter. And one of the things as of late, I've read numerous times is people saying you can't use one inch filters. And that's not true. You can use multiple one inch filters and get the same result uh, as a, a big filter. A big filter in my mind is something that's you know four or five inches thick. So if you can get creative with stuff, uh, it's not really that hard to do, but you have to be able to first convince the technician that it needs to be done and I don't think it's that hard to sell somebody something that they need, even though they didn't realize they wanted it. Because if we can do better filtration, it's just not about the system operating better. It's about the inside of the house and we can snowball, ball, snowball all that stuff. Because uh, I don't want to say people are always looking to spend more money, but when it's something they understand, like better air quality, well, I think they'd be more apt to do it. And that's something that I think a lot of contractors uh, as well as consumers um, miss is that upgrading filtration isn't just upgrading it so that way you clean the air better. That That's a that's one huge reason, but it's also because it can really uh, reduce static pressure and increase the efficiency and in operation of the equipment as well. No doubt. 
So, David, when you look at the um, operation of a piece of equipment um, or what are some of the indicators that you uh, would, would look at first? What are some of the things you would notice that would tell you that potentially you have a problem? It's with anything. A lot of times people want to jump straight to measurements because that's what we get all excited about. And, of course, you get a nice test instrument, of course, like the DG8 situated there on the screen. And we want to start measuring stuff and we forget the basics. The measurements should just verify you know, a lot of the stuff that we already know. Ed mentioned manual D. If you follow the principles in there and just you can look at fittings and go, that's right or that's not right. So it always starts with the visual inspection. I mean, just take the doors off the equipment. Look at it. You can look at a lot of these things and you don't need test instruments to go, OK, that's messed up. But what you do need is the test instruments to be able to quantify it because otherwise it's just an opinion. Anybody can go in there and say, you know, this is messed up. However, once you put measurements to it, you start to take the test instruments, you apply the measurements in the right way. Now you can quantify the how horrible or how good that duct system is. You don't know unless you test it. So a lot of times we have, we want to run and grab a tape measure and a duct calculator and start sliding the magic scale and trying to figure out where it fits instead of just taking a live measurement after we've done a, a visual inspection and say, here's what we've got. What would you like to do to see if we can improve it? So, I mean, starting off the visual inspection, I think is number one. And, and a lot of people, they get sick and tired of me saying this, uh, but it, it it's a step that I think we need to take, just like a medical professional would. They're going to start with basic vital signs. And they're going to start with your first, they're going to make sure you can pay. Then they're going to go through and they're going to measure your blood pressure. <laughs> they're going to measure your weight. They're going to measure your temperature your pulse, all, all these vital signs that are just essential in every single call. And yet we kind of throw that mentality out the window on a service call and we want to jump straight to the refrigerant gauges. Where if we follow the, that same principle, that same parallel, and we measure vital signs of an HVAC system, the static pressure, the weight, of course, being airflow because it's in pounds per hour, um, the temperature being the temperature, and of course, pulse being the electrical side of it. These are the basics that we can measure and then see how close it is to manufacturer specifications. If we're close, then we're okay. If we're outside of those ranges, then we start to get into diagnostics and figuring out why. So I want to go back to, we'll talk a little bit about measurement for sure. That's going to be a big focus of this, but I want to go back to some of those um, just down and dirty visual inspections, observations, um, things that you can notice about the equipment. And I'll, and I'll offer up one while you're thinking up your mental list. Um, is when you hear stuff screaming, like when you walk up to a piece of equipment and you hear the the blower door whistling on a fan coil, or you hear a return screaming at you, or you see a, even a supply um, yelling at you. Uh, it's a pretty good indication that that something is not quite right. You stole uh, my Ed, thunder. Oh man, sorry. I was trying. I was trying to get the conversation <laughs> rolling. But uh, no, what, what I, else you got, uh, no, the screaming. Uh, one of my famous lines is, "You shouldn't have to turn the TV up when the system comes on." And I am absolutely, completely convinced that the average homeowner thinks that's normal. Yep. And it's so ingrained in people that I'd be lying if I didn't say it was ingrained in me. In my last house, I had a ground source heat pump that sat on the wall, or, excuse me, on the other side of the wall from my family room. And in the summertime, when I heard that compressor growl and I heard that thing come on, it, it brought peace to me. Because I, I knew it was going to feel cool in here. And when that thing would come on in heat, I would sit there and start to just, oh, I'd say mean things to it. Because all I knew it was, it was doing was costing me money. And it was loud. And it was a compressor noise because I even know how to, knew how to do duct work back then. But uh, nonetheless, it, it's that idea that I've gotten a lot of mileage over uh, over the years from talking to customers when you say it's not supposed to be like that. And then when you do design and install a system and you finally get that complaint that you're like, wait, what, what did you say? Well, I can't tell when it's running. And you tie the little piece of yarn to the supply outlet and it goes, you know, it's wiggling when the, the fan is running so they know it's on and then you step out the back door and you do a little dance so they don't see and you're really happy with yourself for a couple of days. It's a it's a big deal. But that that noise thing is is huge. Uh, I don't know anybody who is proficient at this stuff that doesn't like to be able to tell if a system is functioning properly or not. 
before they get the tools out. There's a lot of things you can look at, but there's a huge difference between somebody who can get the tools out and actually quantify things and somebody who does it all based off of, um, I, I don't want to say emotions, but I'm going to say they, because they know. And, um, we call it spidey sense. You yeah. Go completely on spidey sense, you know? Um, and, and just cause you can say it louder doesn't mean you're right. So. <laughs> and I guess you would know that for you. I guess oh, well, you no, know. I'm not really. A, <laughs> well, maybe I'm a little loud from the stage. I mean, come on. <laughs> oh yeah. That's a little different. I don't have an inside voice. I've always had that outside voice, but. So, David, what are some of the main things? I mean, you mentioned a few of the visual inspections, taking panels off, looking at things. Are there any other um, sort of visual or tactile types of indicators that um, that you would suggest people consider? Yeah, it, the fil you mentioned the filter. Is the filter caved in? A lot of times everybody will take that panel off. Blowers just you know, suck the filter in or the insulation has pulled off the sides. Uh, condensate blow off. If you've got any type of an air handler that's a draw through coil, if there's staining, for condensate on the blower housing, you usually got some type of an airflow issue going on. Um, another thing, check out the uh, drain. If there's crud in the drain, you've probably got some type of an airflow issue where dirt particulate is bypassing that filter. And of course, it's going to capture on the any surface that it can capture or they'll capture it against airflow. We always think of it as a blower with a coil. We don't ever think about the condensate drain. So just some other visual clues like that. And then also it's just service history. Is it a piece of equipment that's constantly had problems out of the compressor? There's always been hot and cold spots. So anytime there's been continuous ongoing problems with that system, it's usually a red flag that there's some type of an airflow issue going on. Are there any signs to look for? I know uh, obviously high static is a bad thing, but, you know, Basically, to differentiate the difference between uh, too much airflow, and I know that's probably pretty uncommon to have too much airflow or too small of ductwork. Like, what could somebody look for? Too much airflow is a thing. Yeah. Uh, it is. Uh, during the um, American Reinvestment Act uh, in my market, there was a lot of 16 sear, or the goal to reach a sear of 16 was very prevalent. And in order to do it, you had to put in like a 23 inch furnace and the real wide coil. And you would buy a furnace with a four ton drive and match it with a two and a half ton air conditioner. Cause that was the most common combo that got a 16 sear. And people would call and complain that, you know, my old air conditioner used to make it comfortable in here. This thing drops the temperature of the air, but I don't feel comfortable. And you'd get there and you'd turn the, the uh, go over to and turn the TV down. Uh, before to show them that when we get done doing what we're going to do, you're going to be able to hear your TV at this much lower level. And all we were doing is taking a furnace with a four ton drive and taking it from 1600 CFM and knocking it down to a thousand. And then the new complaint would start. And are you ready for what the new complaint is? They can hear the gurgling of the refrigerant through the expansion valve when it runs because it's so quiet now that it has the proper <laughs> airflow. So it, it, the, too much airflow is a reality. Too much airflow and not enough ductwork, that's probably more of a reality than the story I just told. But yeah, it's it, it goes back to that whole noise thing. You, you can really tell the health of a system um, before you actually measure. Uh, again, I don't want to throw it out there that you can... Um, you know, just listen to it and you can tell, but or you can feel it. What, yeah. what, what about, what about just looking at the size of like the return or something like that and, and looking at the nominal tonnage? I don't have that skill yet. And I like making fun of people that put the really bad duck systems on the internet and say, Oh, there's no way that thing has enough air yet. And I'm like, well, can you fill me in on that secret? I want that skill because I still have to measure it. I, I can't look at a bad duct system because I might be looking at a bad duct system and it's only got two tons of air moving through it. So I I am not quick to judge a duct system based off of how bad it is uh, or its physical size. Uh, I associate the guy that wants to line his duct slide up with 0.1 and a piece of 20 by eight with the same guy that every duct design is done at 0.1 or some magical number and he calls it um he doesn't call it friction rate he calls it design static which 
makes me squish my face every time somebody uses that that uh, description of something. All right, before we get into before we get into uh, more on measurement, I want to I want to pay homage to uh, to Jack Rice here. Uh, Jack Rice here. Um, the old don't blow air on people. Uh, that's one of the, one of the first rules. And that's not necessarily saying like low system airflow, uh, but it is something that a lot of times you're going to get complaints from clients simply because uh, we're blowing air on people when we don't need to. That's definitely a thing. Yeah, yeah, true. For sure. One of the other things that somebody else mentioned uh, that I think is worth mentioning here is that Ed likes big ducks and he cannot lie, um, which, we've, <laughs> which we've heard a lot as well. So and we'll get into that. Uh, I just wanted to wanted to throw a couple comments up there. So let's talk a little bit about measuring. Um, David, we'll turn this over to you. What are some of the first uh, measurements that you want people to take once you've kind of already have pretty good indications that you have airflow issues? If if the visual inspection checks out, you know, you don't have a dirty blower wheel or anything along that line because it's going to affect the measurements. Then the first measurement always to start out with, in my opinion, is total external static pressure or external static pressure, depending on the source that you look at. And you're simply looking at the amount of resistance or the amount of pressure that that piece of air handling equipment has to work at. Of course, those test locations are going to vary depending on the equipment type and how it's rated. Uh, a gas furnace, as you're showing on the screen, has an external coil. So it's actually an external pressure to the way that that furnace was rated from the manufacturer. And the way that we teach it at NCI is to consider how it comes as shipped from the manufacturer. If it's not included in the box as shipped from the manufacturer, then it's an external static. So for a gas furnace, for instance, the furnace, the blower, the heat exchanger controls, that's all stuff that's internal. The manufacturer has no idea what coil you're going to put on top of it. They have no idea what duct system what size filter you're going to hook up to it. So those are all external. The easiest way I've seen for guys to mess up measurements is to forget how that piece of equipment was rated. So first is total external. It'll kind of point you into the direction to say, you know, you have high pressure. Yes, you need to dig a little bit deeper. But one of the dangers with this is we tend to make static pressure a silver bullet. And we don't keep it in context with airflow because those two, they work hand in hand. As Ed talked about earlier, the Furnaces that, you know, were having the four ton, five ton blowers during the tax credit days, those were usually a default on the high speed. So you may have been chasing an airflow problem that was nothing more than equipment than was set up right. So total external points you in the right direction. And then, of course, component pressure drops will help to point you in the right direction of what's causing that high external static pressure if you've got it. So by component pressure drops, I mean pressure drops across the coil, pressure entering and exiting. Pressure drops across the filter entering and exiting. And then just your duct pressures. What does your return pressure look like? What's your supply pressure look like? And if they're excessive, that could be an indication that you've got some type of a restriction on that on the side of the system. And that that's where I like to start after the, the visual inspection. It tells you a lot about a profile of that system. And you can see a whole lot. And it kind of goes back to your point, Matt, that just by looking at the external dimensions of a duct, you have no idea what's happening inside of it. And you may have a 20 by 10 duct, but if it's got a lot of sharp turns that the air has to go around, it's not going to function like a 20 by 10 duct. It may only function like a 16 by 6 by the time that you account for the inner area that the air is actually able to move through because of trying to take those sharp 90 degree turns. Hey, David, uh, real quick, you, you mentioned pressure drops and external static pressure. If yeah. you have a dual port manometer... I know a lot of guys trying to figure this out for the first time. You have two hoses. Yeah. It can get really confusing which hose to put where. Is there a way to determine that and does it matter? It depends on the manometer that you're using. If you're using an old school analog manometer like a magnahelic, it does matter. You need to pay attention to where the high port and the low ports go. Low ports, of course, is going to go on the negative side. High port will go on the supply side. And with digital, they're pretty forgiving. They'll pretty much read whatever you give them. The danger with that is that if you're using the two hose method, what we like to do is look for where the resistance is, because usually the higher the resistance, the higher the restriction to airflow. So there's pros and cons to doing one hose versus two hose. So it depends on what you're looking for. If I'm looking for just an external static pressure measurement, I'm going to use two hoses and let the manometer do the math. But if I'm trying to figure out where that pressure is, I'm just going to use a single hose. I hear myself talking right now. I don't even know why I'm here. 
Because <laughs> <laughs> it's it, exactly the same thing. The only part you left out is uh, if you've never done this before, you should do them one at a time. Use a magnahelic gauge because if you hook it up wrong, it just won't read. It just buries the needle. Yeah, it just buries the needle. But that it's it's very true. Uh, I was exposed to this stuff in a, a different way than a lot of people. Uh, the first static pressure reading I ever took with somebody that actually knew what they were doing was with somebody using a DG2. And oh, yes, it was the predecessor to the DG3. And our, our number was 100 pascals. And this is before the digital manometers had inches of water. So I had to learn the inches of water later. But the uh, the number was 100. So if you had 100 pascals on the supply, it was your problem. If you had 100 pascals on the return, it was your problem. But you would you know, hopefully come up with something that was more um, uh, favorable when you did your external static pressure measurement. And then later, it all started to make sense. So let's kind of anchor down for people who aren't in the practice of measuring static pressure. And again, we're not talking about designing from scratch here. We're talking about we're, we're, we're showing up to us. We're showing up to a site. How do you know if your static pressure is too high, so high that it's a problem? Big is bad. And to uh, David's point uh, earlier, uh, one of the most critical things, and I'm going to briefly talk about static pressure as a whole. Uh, external static pressure, a low number is always better if, and you know, go ahead, finish it, David. You know where I'm going. I know exactly where you're go going. Ahead, finish oh, please, it. please, I've talked too much. Go ahead. Uh, it, it's, if, if it's clean inside, if it's dirty inside, low static is bad. And when people are between the idea of getting it and not quite getting it, they'll see a low static and immediately say, oh, this system's great. But it's not. Yep. Uh, a low static can be false. New install, uh, big static's bad, low static's good. Uh, low static might be too low and you might have to make some adjustments to get your airflow where you want it to be. But the uh, idea of all this is simple as it can be. And my number was, was always uh, 100 pascals. So it, it, it's um, four tenths of, of an inch of water column. So if you want to look at it that way, a big number is bad. If it's more than half or two thirds of what the equipment's rated at, at your desired CFM, it's bad. So I don't know if that was too are, much for some to digest. Are you saying, are you saying on one component or your total external? Um, when I'm doing my external static pressure, if the supply is greater than 0.4, that's really bad. If my return is greater than 0.4, it's really bad. But uh, if it's 0.3 and 0.2 and my number is at 0.5, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. So it, it comes back to uh, in comparison to what? And I have a little cheat sheet here. I got to admit, you guys keep saying component. I'm a little bit older because it's a device loss, damn it. Uh, <laughs> but that got changed about 15 years ago and I still get stuck on device. But uh, on the friction rate worksheet, when you look at it for years, even after they changed it, I still use the same one in my, my slides. So yeah, components, but yeah, just look for big numbers and more so than anything, even if you got to make a cheat sheet or do something along those lines, uh, if you're not going to step up and use the, uh, TEC app with the DG eight, uh, you can't do it wrong there. Uh, I would think people would agree with me on that one. You, you're just following the prompts. But even if you got to make a cheat sheet, <clears throat> I worked on a utility program years ago where I used to get contractors all the time that would be very proud of the install they did. And they're and I'm in a furnace coil predominantly market. They'd have one in the supply and one in the return, and they would have perfect numbers that match exact, exactly what the blower data in the uh, furnace install guide said. And I'd look at them and I went, hmm, hmm. And they'd be like, huh? And I'd be like, huh? And <laughs> if the homeowner was there, I would be very professional in that. But if the homeowner wasn't there, I was, ah, wrong answer. You know, I'm like, how are you getting these numbers? Uh, or uh, one of my real favorite ones is they would do in a pressure drop across the coil to estimate airflow. And it would be 0.2179 was the pressure drop. 
and it just happened to be a, a specific brand of coils and they ra uh, rated their coils and pressure drops that to a thousandth of an inch. So I'd be on the phone with them and asking, hey, you know, I want to be with the tech who measured that. I want to see the manometer that he's using. And you, they'd get out there and there wouldn't be holes. And it's like, I I get paid the same whether, you know, I'm passing or failing you. And you're not getting failed. We're just going to do it. And from now on, you're going to do it right. And I made more, way more good connections with people uh, that 15, 20 years later, I still see these people or their kids. And they've uh, they've made it. I mean, some of them are still drooling on themselves in a gutter somewhere. But for the most part, these guys are uh, they're doing fairly well or really well, for that matter. So you mentioned uh, you were mentioned ratings, right? You were, you were talking about furnace and coil markets. Um, there's always a tag on the inside of the side uh, inside of a furnace that rates the maximum maximum rated static pressure. <laughs> oh, oh. I'm sorry. So what does that mean? And do people get hung up on that number, trying to hit that number? I'm hugging you. Uh, and I don't know if you did this on purpose or not, but I love it. Uh, one of my favorite things to share with people is that uh, there is a manufacturer from Arkansas that inside their furnace says that the furnace is supposed to be set up between uh, 0.1 and 1. And then there's manufacturers that say 0.5. And I think there are people that get hung up on that 0.5 for furnaces, and I, I don't agree with it. You and have to look at the blower table. I again, because it depends. You could put my voice in, in in David's screen and vice versa, and yeah, it. There's good ideas like looking at your blower data and saying for a constant torque motor, I'm not going to go over 70% of what's listed on the chart. Uh, on a, uh, a constant airflow, it might be 80% or 60%, whatever you're going to choose with that. But if a manufacturer says that I'm going to give you 1100 CFM at 0.9, they're going to give you 1100 CFM at 0.9. Is it advantageous for you to run at the top of the of the speed of and uh, static pressure of that motor? No, but they're not going to put it in print on that blower chart if it can't do it. And plus, I mean, if you made motors and you convince people to run them right at the top of their limit and they needed a new one every five years, that sounds like good business to me. So wait, you guys think, I, OK, I see some smiles now. I was making sure you got my sarcasm there. Yeah. <laughs> All right. A couple of things that I want to kind of call back to here, because um, as it relates to, because uh, I think some people do get a little overwhelmed with like, all right, well, what number is a good number? Um, obviously, if you're of the nerdy type, you're going to the blower tables, that sort of thing. But again, we're talking about a service tech or a, uh, you know, somebody who's going to who's a salesperson and they're showing out and coming up and it's going to be a change out on the equipment. Uh, these are situations where you don't necessarily, you're probably not going to be referring to blower tables right away. You're going to start with these indicators that you're going to test and come up with some uh, indicators of, am I good or am I not? That's what you want to know. Right. Your number, while he's talking, write your numbers down, Dave, and we're going to compare. What a lot of guys, as you mentioned, Brian, they'll take static pressure measurements, but they don't know what to do with it. Right. A, a simple method that guys can use. If you want to get, it's just quick and dirty. It'll get you close is to take that maximum external static pressure rating and divide it up in percentages across the different components. And let, let's use a furnace, for instance, that's got a maximum external static pressure 0.5. If you're looking for budgets for what to allow for those different components, you can allow 20% for the return duct, 20% for the supply duct, and 20% for the filter, then allow 40% for the coil. That roughly equals up 0.10 for the duct system pressures, 0.10 is a pressure drop across the filter, and then 0.20 is a pressure drop across the coil. So what it does is instead of those numbers just kind of being this abstract value, now you've got something to point to. And as Ed said, is bigger is, is the one that you're really looking for. And is the farther those numbers go away from those budgets, the more they should draw your attention to that component and to investigate it deeper. All right, I heard you want ballpark numbers for people to mess around with. <clears throat> Does that sound about right? I, that's about right. Yeah, yeah give sure. it a, so, a, so, a much uh, purer answer than I'm going to give you right now. But 
uh, anything above 0.1 in the supply is there, you can do better, right? And it's not, uh, as long as you have a little bit of room, it's not that hard to do better. Um, in the return, uh, if it's 0.3 after the filter, as in going into your blower, um, it's not going to hurt me. And if it's 0.2 before the filter, I can kind of live with that. I know I can do better, but with those numbers, I know it can function properly. In the real world, if you just randomly go up and start taking those measurements, you're going to have 0.5 between the filter and the blower, and you're going to have uh, 0.3 or 0.4 in the return somewhere. And then when you do add that return duct four feet away from the return drop uh, that's down in that basement, you'll hear the furnace go, <sighs> and the number drops from 0.4 down to 0.2 or something very manageable. This also goes under the idea that we have somewhat of a realistic filter, but I'm going to say the, the filters are the real kick in the butt in a lot of instances because people want to put a filter in a rack that was supplied by the manufacturer, which that one will never make sense to me. Why the uh, manufacturers supply us with a rack that really doesn't work um, in an ideal fashion. Uh, I've looked at a lot of the stuff with the was a five point fifty five two. I don't know, whatever that's right. Uh, I've been sitting in on those meetings about the filters and how they're rated. And there's a lot of fil uh, filter manufacturers that do exactly what they're required to do. But if you talk to the average contractor and you ask them how to read their tables, they're like, oh, uh, you know, I put one this big in. And that's not how it, it it's not even close to how it works. But we already talked about that. So I'll. I'll shut that off now. Yeah, a couple. Um, and actually, uh, Dustin mentions this, that uh, that Adam actually did a, a good a good tech tip on selecting filters in HVAC school. But uh, give a call out to um, to uh, NCI and TEC, um, True Flow Grid, and then everything NCI teaches will also help with a lot of this. So anybody who wants to uh, have a, a system for really doing this uh, quickly and easily. Um, I definitely recommend both of those, um, both of those companies to kind of help if you want to make a process out of it. Because I know a lot of you, it's like, all right, the, the rule of thumb full, but if you are a technician, you want to do that. Um, the other thing that I wanted to bring up was this, we've already kind of danced around this, but knowing how to do these measurements is super, super important. David talked about it. We had somebody who actually put out a video a while back that was a very notorious where he was trying to point out that um, the type of filter you use didn't matter that much. And what he was doing was measuring the static pressure before the filter and showing how, look, when I put in a, a super dense pleated filter, one inch pleated filter, my static pressure goes down. So as you can see, uh, these are actually good for the equipment uh, versus bad. And so it's just, it's really, really important that you are placing your probes in the right place. You understand the difference between a furnace and a fan coil. And also back to what Ed said a while back, always, always, always recognize that if the system has really low airflow, you're going to have low static pressure. So if you haven't set your pin settings correctly, if it's running in dehum mode, if it's not running up to full speed, um, none of this stuff matters. You're going to have low static pressure and that's not a sign that it's a good thing. And that's where things like uh, the true flow grid come in really handy because then at that point, you can also prove uh, the actual amount of airflow that you have, which is, which is super, uh, super nice. Let's move on now to specifically fixing duct systems, because this is what I think a lot of people came here for. Um, what are some of the things that you're going to do? Um, but what are you going to look for? What are you going to do to say, all right, I, I can make some fixes to this. And what are those fixes? And uh, we'll start with you, David. OK, well, once you've got the measurements, uh, especially, you know, just the static pressure measurements, the next step with that visual inspection is become going to be an interview with the customer. They know their home. They know their building better than anybody. They'll tell you everything that's wrong with it if you present the questions in the right way and you share the data with them. If you're just going out and saying, oh, you know, your duct system looks really bad, you've just given them opinion. Anybody can give them that. But if you go out and you give them data and you say, here's why we think you've got this problem here. Have you ever experienced these types of problems? And, of course, you list them off. And you start to point the repairs in that order. It may be a specific bedroom that has a problem when you just increase the size of the ducts or you can go, you know, even more detailed and take actually delivered airflow measurements. I'm not, you know, no technician would do that, but depending on the scope of work that you're looking at and the specific problem that you're trying to fix, 
you you have to make certain assumptions and you also have to focus on certain things at the same time uh, as we start to look at you know at the equipment i mean there's crazy things that you can do just by changing the filters we talked about the return drop size and in central kentucky they're notorious for we have a lot of basements and of course we got a little bit of everything but we always used to call them splat plenums because what guys would do is they would hang four foot of trunk up against the ceiling joist and they would just tap a 16 by 20 20 by 20 sleeve right in the middle of it and there was like no way for the air to get out of it so it got all confused and it just turned around and it couldn't get anywhere just by tearing that four foot of duct out and actually putting a real duct fitting in there it's crazy I love the sparkles. You guys thought I wasn't paying attention. Didn't you? Yeah, what was that? I don't, I don't even know, know how that happened. happened. I don't, I don't even man. know how you do that. So that was very interesting. <laughs> I <don't know>. any... <laughs> Something I said was magical. Adam, did you do that? No, I did not. But... <laughs> I didn't either. I don't know. I literally don't know how that happened. <laughs> All right. It was no, me. Uh... I'm sorry. <laughs> what <did> you know? <laughs> Uh, David, uh, you mentioned deadheading a plenum into the bottom of a duct. And yeah. as soon as you said that, um, a class that I took a few years ago popped into my head, duct sy system optimization, which is an NCI class, yeah. which that kind of made me also think as I was going through that class, a specific section in manual D. Can we talk a little bit about selecting fittings and maybe looking at fittings and seeing what we could do to possibly replace certain pieces of the ductwork? Definitely, because you know, just as the measurements are going to guide you in there, that direction after you're taking them, the visual inspection air, the simplest thing to think about duct fittings is air does not make 90 degree turns. It never has, it never will. It, it's the easiest way to think about it is like traffic on an interstate. If you have a car driving 80 miles an hour down the interstate, I don't condone that you do that. If you're driving 80 miles down the interstate and you decide all of a sudden that you're going to make a 90 degree turn and whip it, if you're driving anything that's high profile, you're going to flip and roll and spin and turn all around. Air does the exact same thing. We just don't see the wreck, but we do experience the results of it when it comes to the performance of a system. So long sweeping bins, just like exit ramps on an interstate, the longer the transition, the better. And just sweeping things like that, that you can look at. And Ed, Ed can talk to what the equivalent length differences are. But I mean, just by changing a fitting out, I mean, you can drop a hundred equivalent feet in just one duct fitting, just, just by going, I'll let it explain what equivalent length is. But I mean, you can change just at the equipment, changing those types of, of things. Ed, you mentioned the deadhead, uh, transitions, uh, turning veins are, are an easy way if you've got access and, and you can find single wall veins residentially or fittings that have a radius throat, radius heel, if you've got the room. A lot of times you're going to be limited by by the constraints of what you can deal with and the customer's budget because you know ultimately we can talk about doing all this stuff but ultimately they have to want to buy it because if they don't buy it nothing's going to happen you can be the the greatest technician when it comes to this stuff in the world but if you can't sell it it's not going to do you or your customers any good so you do have to be able to take this stuff and translate it into a language that's very simple and I think by taking that and comparing it to things like traffic, simple things like that, the analogy like we would use for a medical professional, vital signs, these are the things that are going to help the customer make sense of it and then tie the pain that they've been having to the symptoms that you're measuring and finding a problem for. It's kind of a long-winded way of, I guess, trying to answer that. I hope that helps. Uh, and so I have, a, I have a question off of that. How well could you pre How well can you predict the change that something like that is going to make? So let's say, for example, like here we have a lot of flex duct. If I, you know, used some uh, some hard pipe nineties, you know, mm -hmm. and, and and things like that. And um, when it comes to the filter, I feel like I could confidently say, it, you know, because it has a rating. Right. Um, but in terms of, yeah, like how like just yeah, how confident can you get in with with some of that stuff? Well, fan law two is up on the screen. So, I mean, if you can measure a static pressure at that location, you know what the airflow measurement is and what it should be. You can dump it into the set, that fan law two calculation and you can pretty accurately predict what's going to happen if you make those changes. However, once those changes are made, that calculation goes out the window because it, it's only if the system conditions. If the airflow remains the same. Conditions aren't changed. I got a good way to to rig something to see what it's going to do if you're interested in hearing it um 
please. Actually, I got two, but the the first one that I really want to go over is something that's very commonplace. Uh, if you're in a market that has basements, in a, a, a market that you see a uh, furnace next to a atmospheric water heater, and it's the typical problem, the second floor is uh, warmer than it should be in the summertime. So uh, you want to seal the lid and more insulation. We know that part, or maybe you don't and you should investigate that, but uh, we're HVAC people, so we want to get more air on the second floor. Well, you got to get more air across the entire system. So one of my moves used to be, you go and the first thing you do is take your car keys and put them on the gas valve of the water heater and put it to vacation. Uh, this way you don't leave and leave the water heater turned off and you turn the water heater off because it's located directly next to the furnace. I would, uh, go upstairs and put the fan on on and then I would go on the top floor and go to one of the floor registers and I would use the proverbial duct tape and toilet paper and I would use an ottoman or a laundry basket or something and put it next to the floor outlet. I would put the uh, duct tape and the toilet paper so it was above the floor register and the toilet paper wiggled like that because a homeowner doesn't understand mass flow or any crap like that. they understand toilet paper wiggling right they understand the handometer right but this is a visual then we go downstairs into the basement and we take our furnace door and we lift it halfway up what's the toilet paper on the second floor doing now it's standing straight up because we've increased the, the volume coming out of that outlet substantially. And what you can do is replicate the amount you opened that furnace by tapping into the return with a 10 or a 12 inch flex. And one of our favorite moves in one of this, these specific neighborhoods was we were right uh, where the furnace lived was right underneath the dining room. And everybody had a china cabinet or a hutch, whatever you call it, uh, on the same wall. We would move it away from the wall. We would put a uh, 16 or 14 and a half inch by 30 inch uh, return in the floor with a grate covering it. And then down in the basement, we were hacked, so we would pan it, right? We wouldn't use real ductwork. And then we would tap off of it with a piece of flex. But th those systems had, and now I'll get technical, had a, uh, a return static of greater than 0.4 that when we were done doing what we just did, we had a return static before the filter that was less than 0.1. And we saw a little bit of a rise on the supply, which isn't a uh, surprise because you're moving more air. Uh, at least on that section of the, the duct system, as well as the return. But the moral of the story here was you could show somebody in less than 15 minutes what the results were going to be for 1250 or I mean, and this is a long time ago. So for $8,000, you could show them what the results would be. But instead of saying, let me try this and we'll see if it works, we'll be able to show it to them. What you have to do is uh, beg them not to, when you leave, to open the furnace door and leave it that way because they saw the improvement upstairs uh, with having the water heater right next to it. I'm assuming that I don't have to go into much of an explanation. With the water heater being so close, the negative pressure will draw the flame out. Potentially, that's probably worst case, but the products of combustion aren't going to go up the vent if we're creating that much more negative pressure uh, right next to it. So it was a pretty easy fix, mm. but it was one of those things that you could uh, see what it did and prove it to the customer uh, how much of a, a difference it made. And one of the, the last points on that, putting a return on the first floor will get you more air on the second floor if you leave the bedroom doors open, right? You can't close the bedroom doors and say, oh, well, it doesn't work. Well, no kidding. It's not going to. So it's, just, uh, it's, it's hinged on a couple of things, but I've seen improvements of multiple degrees, and I'm not going to start throwing unrealistic numbers out there because it makes no sense at this point. This is something you can do tomorrow. This is I'm going to say somebody that's on right now lives in a two-story house that I just described, and they're going to be doing it uh, right when I go to bed. Uh. <laughs> so one important question that Neil asks that's very important is what brand toilet paper do you recommend? Just 
anything in particular. Scott's. He said definitely not Cottonelle, I think. Costco. Where else would you go buy <laughs> toilet point. paper? Good point. Good point. Yeah. Very, very, very wise. Um, all right. So we're talking about practical things that you can do not only to prove it to the client, but then also practical things you can do in upgrades. Uh, David, you talked about fittings, looking at your fittings, um, that kind of thing. What are some practical um, things that you would do in sort of modern construction? You, you generally aren't going to have a lot of space to work with. Uh, what are some of the top priorities that you would build? Specifically, as we're talking about system airflow, we'll talk a little bit about sort of individual zone issues. But in terms of system airflow, what are some of those top priorities of uh, things that you would build into your scope? Inlet and outlet. Look at how the air is getting in and out of the equipment. Those are going to be the two biggest things. If you can relieve the pressures there, sometimes you can cut the resistance to a system in half just by having good supply duct fittings and good return duct entering fittings at the air handling equipment, making sure that the air is not trying to make a sharp 90 degree turn or worse, multiple 90 degree turns as the air is going into it. So I think that's one of the biggest things is trying to make sure that you're not creating a problem, but instead oversizing it. Uh, and a lot of times I know we get all worried about undersizing or oversizing fittings at the equipment. It's hard to do. And, and as I said, you gotta have, you, you have to deal with the constraints that you've got. And that's one of the, the difficult things about doing this is sometimes there's going to be houses and buildings that beat you and there's not a thing that you can do about it. You can only do the best you can with what you've got. But with a lot of this, your imagination is going to be the limit as, as it comes to, it. of course, how much your customers are willing to invest. I'm going to tee up this softball from Jenry to Ed. So can the duct be too big or velocity too low? Absolutely. All right. If you can't get that duct to go in the front door to get it up in the attic, it's obviously too big. <laughs> um, I, I'm, I just turned it in. I just wrote an article uh, that said, you know, can a duct be too big because of some of the, um, I don't know, teasing I've been doing with people and they're really losing their minds when I write a duck can't be too big. And I have to predicate that on if you follow the guidance in manual D, what I said is 100% factual, right? It, people are concerned about velocity and that makes me happy because our velocity should never be too high because that messes with how the system works. But as far as the velocity in a branch run, it can't be too low. It literally can't. People have to focus on making sure they have the proper volume through a branch run, not the velocity. There's a chart in Manual D that shows a 12-inch duct and a 6-inch duct delivering 100 CFM. And the it's actually 6 through 12. So a 12, it's, and you guys can figure it out. The velocity changes dramatically, but they're all under the max of 900 feet per minute. And the volume is all the same 100 CFM when it goes into a 10 by 4 boot. And when it exits out through the uh, supply register, it's all uh, and it's, uh, I think, a 10 by 4. It's, uh, and this would be something you would get from the manufacturer's engineering data, but it tells you that 100 CFM moving through a register of that size is moving at a velocity of 700 feet per minute. So the, the throw and spread, and I got to put the P word in there, the predictable throw and spread that comes out of the face of our register is based off of the volume, right? It's the volume, not the velocity. So the, the guy who's telling you, you got to keep your velocity up, you don't take advice about, you know, relationships and pregnancy and stuff from that guy because he just don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> and I think it's an, another common issue where people are just getting things confused. Like, they does are. velocity matter? Yes, it does. As yep. it comes out of the as it comes out of the supply duct, as it comes out of the vent. Um, but does it matter in the duct? I mean, I guess it could. I, there's an argument that it comes to a point where it can, but and it is, certainly isn't the main thing to consider. Let's let's uh, point out Neil here, and he says it matters in a vented attic. Yeah, uh, I would never uh, dissuade anybody from running velocity and branch run ducks up against the limit. That's a good idea. For what I'm going to assume he's saying it, it's it's going to matter because there's a potential uh, for condensation on the vapor barrier of the duct. Sure, I'm not gonna run 12 inch supplies when a six will suffice. I mean, I just, as long as I'm following the rules, I'm following the rules. 
what I'm um, trying to make the point uh, simply is you, you got to follow the the guidance, and that is that the uh, the volume is what really matters. Uh, the velocity is uh, is not nearly as big a deal. So, Ed, on the flip side of that coin, we talked about low low velocities, right? Now, um, if we talk about the upper side of velocities, the guardrails that Manual D puts in place. Um, is there value in somebody bringing along a duculator when they're inspecting a duct system and, you know, swinging it, swirling it around or whatever it is and, you know, lining it up to the, the duct size and, and looking at what the velocity is? Like, what is it? Yes. Uh, if you've been doing this for any length of time, you can walk up to a bedroom, especially if you've done a dozen load calculations in your life. Right. And again, especially if you've done a, a modern home and you've done a house with no insulation and one in between, you can look at a 12 by 12 bedroom and say this is going to need somewhere between 70 and 150 CFM. That's not far fetched. Well, if you look at a duct that's four inch to know that to, you're going to need 50 to 150 uh, at a minimum, I'm going to need a velocity of, of 1200 feet per minute. All bets are off. That's I can't work unless they want to turn the TV up and get giant speakers behind them so they can hear it, right? So it's it, there is value in that. What there isn't value in is looking at the, the duck slide and saying, I got 20 by 8, that's 1,000 CFM, because I just want to punch him in the throat when he says that. But different story for a different thing. And we've even got guys that are out there teaching to measure static pressure in the duct to see what it is and then put that on the duct calculator. And that's how much air is moving through that duct. Yes. It, I'm it convinced be farther from the truth. Right. I'm convinced that there's more people out there that are teaching that than are teaching manual D proper. And I think there's people out there that are saying they're teaching manual D that should uh, change the name of what they're teaching to I teach duct design because what they're teaching is not manual D, because if they're teaching manual D, there's a whole bunch of things you have to include. If you don't mention anything about register selection when you're doing your duct design, then you're not teaching anything that is going to resemble manual D. If, if you're doing duct systems without dampers, um, I mean, I've seen a few of these systems where they run a trunk through an attic and they use uh, eight branch runs and they use eight boxes of flex and cut both ends of the flex open and run it in both directions and say it's a self-balancing system. I am. That's a joke in case you guys are thinking I'm serious about that one. But uh, there's a, a section in manual do that says you can do a self-balancing system and it is. I guess, sort of realistic, but nobody's going to go to do all that. People are just going to omit the dampers and say, well, yeah, a couple of rooms are a little warmer than the others. Uh, and maybe just hope that your metric of success is whether the people call and complain. Because I know there's a lot more people with the measured performance of the duct system afterwards. Their metric is my customers don't complain uh, that they that they rest their laurels on. Because if they actually measured it, you know, behind sticking their hand up there was um, it just it's mind boggling is the easiest way to put it. And I got caught. I was reading a comment at the same time. It's not skull. I'm drinking uh, <laughs> polar <laughs> black cherry uh, seltzer. <laughs> All right. Hey, so uh, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead, David. I was going to say, Ed, you mentioned something earlier about the, the interaction of doors. And I think that's something that a lot of times as a technician, that they don't take into consideration near enough is how much of an impact an interior door has. We assume if it's got an undercut that it's going to work just right. And a lot of times we fail to consider that if it's there's a central return on that system, which is common throughout the country, that that door is a damper. It's a conditioned space panel damper. And if you close the door, you have shut off the pathway for the air to get from the supply register back out to the return grill. And a lot of times we assume, you know, oh, well, maybe if I undercut the door two inches, you know, it'll work okay. And that's not the case. You know, unless you can sell a customer, a lot of times saloon style doors, or bathroom style doors for that room, you're going to have a hard time making the pressures balance. So, I mean, I think it, considering that interaction and how they work for a technician, those are other things that you can also do. We talked about the hand I mean, or the toilet paper test. See how much of a difference you get between the door open and the door closed. 
Sometimes it's substantial. Yeah, a couple of things that I wanted to just kind of bring up so that we can you know, give people some takeaways here. We're going to talk about some of the test out that you can do as well. Test in, test out is huge and it's something we all talk about. Um, so, David, you already talked about improving the ductwork, the connections to the equipment, improving the filters. So you have lower face velocities, whether you do that at the equipment or whether you do it through multiple fil uh, filter back returns, or whether you do it through one giant filter back return or however you do it. Decreasing that face velocity, getting more surface area, um, decreasing the static pressure. That stuff is all huge. Um, increasing the you know supply connection, return connection, all of that. Um, what do you think about things like a lot of people now are talking about using flex only for straight runs and using, um, you know, when you, whenever you have to make a 90 or 45 or whatever, using fittings. What are your thoughts on that as part of a kind of a modern um, solution if you're going to utilize flex? It, the, not to give you a flip and answer, but I mean, it, it really it depends. Uh, I've seen a lot of flex duct systems put in very poorly and it gets a bad you know, it gets a bad, it gets a bad rap because of it. I've also seen and put in some flex duct systems that really work. I mean, it works. It's the, it's the craftsmanship of the installation. And if someone wants to use sheet metal elbows to try to remove some of that resistance out, or they want to use a radius bend and maybe oversize the flex, as long as you're getting the result, I don't, I don't know if it's going to be a, you know, if and you know, six or half dozen the other way, whether it's going to make a difference. A lot of it's going to be personal preference of whoever the installing contractor is. And that, that's just my take on it. I know we did some things that other contractors would say, you know, I don't understand why those guys did that. Uh, for instance, if we went in and we did a duct renovation, which, you know, I mean, we were doing a full duct optimization a lot of times, it was rare that we used back pan floor plans, uh, pan wall returns we usually just abandoned them and we would go back with a floor return and we would try to find a, a space where we could get a ducted return up because they could almost never be renovated because they were pulling air from across the walls. They weren't an airtight channel to pull air through. So I think a lot of times it's going to be dependent on the personal preference of the contractor, but if you get the measured results, it's going to be kind of hard to argue with. One of the other things um, that I've talked about a lot, and I, and, and, I, and I actually have mixed feelings about this, but I want to hear your thoughts. When you're in a kind of fixing a problem scenario, so you're not going to replace the whole duct system, um, but you're trying to fix some issues. I'm a fan of oversizing ductwork wherever possible, not to the extreme, yes. but going on the high end of size and then utilizing balancing dampers. Um, what, what, what are your thoughts on that? I agree with you 100%. That, that's how we used to do most of our systems. Mm -hmm. If you can do it you, and you've got the free area, it's it's crazy not to, because you can always throttle the damper down. Ed, thoughts? Yeah, uh, give the, the air some place to go. Or another way to say it is when systems have high static pressure, uh, relieve the pressure. The, the low hanging fruit is always gonna be add returns because it's usually easier. Uh, one of our favorite things to do in a couple specific neighborhoods, we had a uh, oil furnace was an upflow in a room behind a uh, laundry room that was attached to a garage that had an attic above it. And then it was a, right next to a two story house. And we were running a 12 inch flex off the top of the plenum. And I want to say we were approaching a full inch of external static pressure with these systems. So we had a lot of excess pressure. We were coming right off the, the top of the plenum. The uh, trunk duct through the house ran between the first and second floor. They were two story houses, slab on grade. But there was enough room in the peak of the garage roof that it lined up with the hallway for the second floor. Now, in a perfect world, we're never going to put a supply outlet in a hallway. But when you have an upstairs that is uh, five to 10 degrees warmer than the bottom floor, and you have the perfect opportunity with 12 or 13 feet of flex to do a, a 32 by 10 supply outlet blowing it down the hallway, and it took you an hour and a half and you could sell it for you know, a, a nice markup, you do it. And 
it was not uncommon for us to do repairs like that, getting rid of the pressure, adding an additional supply, and we'll call it a, a, a trunk. I mean, it was one branch run, but we would see external static pressures drop by 0.2 and 0.3. Uh, it's, and it's something that I know it's not just in my market. Um, Dave from uh, Bay down there in Florida, he had gotten a hold of me. It was something that I had done in, uh, in an article. And he was saying, have you ever tried? And I was like, yeah, it's, you know, it's like David and I talking right now with regards to we could have started or finished every point we made because it goes back to the the very idea that if you understand duct systems and you understand static pressure and um, and volume, uh, it's it's not really all that difficult. And it's well. Dare I say it now, it's pretty easy once you understand it, but that's like saying anything. Once you understand whatever it is you're trying to to perfect, well, it's easy now because you understand it. But ductwork isn't that hard. And one last thing I do want to point out when it comes to ductwork, or maybe airflow is a better way to describe it. Our industry looks at combustion, electricity, uh, the refrigeration circuit, and fluid movement. You can talk to the majority of people that are technicians out there and he or she will tell you what you want to hear about combustion what you want to hear about um, the refrigeration circuit or cycle and uh, and they understand electricity but you ask them about fluid movement and then anything that flows is is uh, a fluid thanks steve rogers he taught me that uh, but that's uh, airflow is you know fluid movement people don't understand it and the part that almost bugs me about it is, I think it's easier to understand than the other three things that we have to deal with. So, uh, you know, it might be, uh, I mean, might be in the minority when I say that, but I think it's true. Airflow isn't hard, uh, but and don't make it hard. Uh, you, you can go beyond just sticking your hand in front of the vent and going, yeah, baby, that, that's a good one, uh, because there's more to it. But once you understand it, the, there's ability to make a bunch of money on it because people need it. It's not that they want it, they need it. And people will be more apt to spend money on things that they need than things that obviously they don't want. All right. So let's kind of wrap up, um, David, if you can kind of um, talk through testing out, like um, what are some of the things that you want to do? Obviously testing in to decide that there is a problem that's worth solving. And then what are some things you test out to ensure that you have improved upon the problem may not have gotten perfect, especially in sure. a retrofit application like we talked about. It, a lot of it is just verifying what you did. And, and the whole reason for testing out is so that if something happens and the work failed to meet the expectations that you had, you can make minor adjustments and repairs to see what's going on before the, you know, before the customer finds out. But anything that you test in should be tested out. And that way you have a comparison so you can look at where you were versus where you are. And sometimes the results are great and you, you know, hey, pat yourself on the back. And other times you're like, yeah, kind of sucks. So, you know, depending on what you do, test it. You know, now granted, we've got static pressure and fan airflow. Those are pretty simple. You can do those on, on any replacement. It's even better if you've got something like a, a true flow grid because you can, they can print out the report. The nice thing about that is that then it's not you saying it. It's a third-party application. Uh, if you have your refrigerant readings hooked up, you could have Measure Quick do it. And what that does is it gives the customer not an insurance policy, but it's an assurance policy that they got what they paid for. And so any of those measurements, you guys know I'm huge on the combustion safety side of things. Uh, one thing with duct repairs, don't do duct repairs. It'll kill your customers. Um, you only pull them once uh, to part with the duct repairs that you do. Uh, Ed mentioned, you know, raising the door up. I and mean, how many times have you guys gone out and looked at a return drop and it's got like a 12 by 12 return grill cut in the side of it? I mean, you don't do Kevorkian duct repairs for your customers. You make sure that you're pulling the air from the right area, such as a main large part of the house. But anytime you take these measurements, the other thing that they do on a test out is they're going to alert you if there's something that needs to be changed. Refrigerant is going to be one of the biggest ones because typically you're going to be pulling it out of the system if you made some type of an adjustment. Because you know, we, we just, we tend to grab the magic jug of refrigerant and start throwing the gas to it and, until we get a suction pressure and a, head pressure that we're happy with. So once you start looking at the other parameters of it, there can be red flags that help you make adjustments that you need to. Yeah. Um, so 
looking through these, looking through uh, David's slides, I, re I really liked this one. I, I like kind of the iterative process, right? Like you go out and you try something and maybe you're not happy with the results, like David said. Um, and then, you know, you can keep working towards you say, okay, what, you know, what happened there? What didn't go right? Because that's happened to me a couple of times recently. I'm like, oh, yeah, uh, uh, you know, yeah. I'm just going to do this and it's going to make a big difference. And it hasn't. And so then it's kind of got me, you know, I'm still working through the process of figuring out what do I need to do to really um, to really get things right for people. Well, that point that you're at, Matt, that's the one that most people do in this can't overcome. That's another one of those obstacles is they'll try it. And if it doesn't work, they're like, forget it. This stuff doesn't work. I'm done with it or the measurements don't add up, or there's something that happens, the first obstacle, they just get totally derailed and go back to what they're doing. If you don't believe in this stuff, you're not going to do it. Because it, it does challenge some of the things that, that you've done for years, as Ed mentioned, when we started out. You know, when you start to do this stuff, you're going to challenge how you've done your installs. The cool thing about it is, if you do good work, it makes those results transparent. And that is something that a customer is willing to buy. They can trust you with that. That's something that they can take to the bank, that assurance a policy. But if you're somebody who doesn't do very good work, you should be very afraid of this because those measurements are also transparent in that aspect of it. They will reveal the craftsmanship of your work. Yeah, really good stuff, guys. Um, so unfortunately, we are already here at time. It's amazing how fast these things always go. Um, a couple things that I wanted to mention um, and of course, long time uh, contributor, really a uh, good friend of mine, Neil Comparado, pointed out that, David, your articles have inspired a lot of us um, to you, do Neil. better work. And you can still find a lot of those out there. Um, really great articles. NCI, obviously, great resource. ACA being the resource for the, a lot of the design stuff. Um, Ed has his Ask Ed stuff out there that's really great. Um, anything, as we kind of wrap this up, though, I want to I want to give you all a chance to sort of give a final uh, final word or just a final encouragement to people who are looking to just do a little bit better um, to improve their uh, clients' homes a little bit better on the airflow side. What are some uh, kind of your final um, final tips or final words? We'll start with you, Ed. Oh, uh, I'm usually not at a loss for words, but I am right now. <laughs> <laughs> you're just you're just overwhelmed yeah, I, 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 no I, I usually go and say something stupid and try and make people laugh uh as far as trying to am i trying to convince homeowners or, or uh contractors right now <laughs> whoever mostly you contractors whoever you want to convince um, yeah <laughs> well here's my stock answer uh manage people's expectations right don't tell them uh about things that they want to hear uh, explain to them the reality of how things are actually going to work. And you're going to have far fewer people unhappy with you. Don't chase uh, unrealistic uh, 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 problems. Uh, if somebody wants it cooler in their house, more capacity is not going to give them really what they want. Uh, you're going to be able to make it colder when it's hotter out, but you're going to make it damper when it's not. So, you have to have realistic expectations to what the systems will do and bringing it back to duct systems. If you have bad duct systems, you're going to have inadequate airflow. It's really just that simple. Uh, and if you're really not that good at the whole sizing of the duct systems, a big duct is never going to hurt you. I've heard both uh, David and uh, Brian say uh, tonight about uh, the word oversize uh, makes me scrunch my face. Uh, properly sized and dampers. Uh, we're not oversizing anything because oversized to me implies that um, it's going to be detrimental to the performance of what it is that we're doing. So it's not going to be. You can have a really big duct. You can have a really big duct system. And then, oh, all right, uh, Neil, uh, I'm not going to put it in a vented attic, but I could have a really big duct system. And as long as I have uh, dampers in there and I can force the air where it needs to go, it'll work every time. If I have a, a duct system that is undersized, which is a thing, uh, then who knows what's going to happen. And again, go back to the 10 or 12 things that Manual D says you have to do and you'll get predictable results. If you omit even one of those things, I don't know what's going to happen. You might get lucky and you might not. 
All right, David, how about you? Start on your own stuff. That's where you'll get comfortable doing this stuff. Uh, if you take this as almost a, like an experiment, if you do it, use it as a learning opportunity. You're trying to figure out what's going to happen. Matt mentioned the situation, you know, where he did something it didn't quite come out like expected. Document that. Figure out what happened and make it a learning opportunity. Don't beat yourself up if it didn't work. So start on your own stuff. Give yourself time to fail on this because that's what's going to happen. You're, you're going to make mistakes and that's okay. Do it on your own stuff. Get comfortable. Work at your own pace. And for some of the guys that are doing this that may be brand new, it may be a huge obstacle just installing a test port in a furnace cabinet. I remember that. That For some technicians, that's enough to turn them away from doing this because they're scared <laughs> to death that they're going to stop the drill and they're going to hear that dreaded hissing noise. Let so, the snake out. <laughs> yes. I mean, this is why you want to start on your own stuff and just make it an experiment to learn from. And then you'll you'll get better the more that you do it. Write down what you you know, what you experimented with, what you saw. And all this stuff starts to make sense the, the more that you do it. But if you just sit there and ruminate on it and fake on it, you're never going to make any progress on it. So I, my, my suggestion would be just start, start with your own stuff. Very good advice. And just remember, if you ever uh, don't feel confident starting somewhere or just doing, doing what you can with what you have, just remember Brock Purdy, got drafted last and uh, and he's just good at football and is going to lead the 49ers <laughs> to the Super Bowl. So if Brock Purdy can do that, then uh, then you can learn how to uh, improve the duck system. Uh, thank you guys so much. Appreciate you. And uh, we will see uh, everybody who took the time out to uh, to watch this. Hopefully we'll see you again uh, next time we have a live stream. Appreciate Two you. or three weeks, guys. right? Yeah. Yeah, we'll see people like down Thanks, in uh, Claremont. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. At the symposium. yeah, for sure. Thanks, see gentlemen. some people in two weeks in, in Chicago.